Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Is this working tonight? Good. Excellent. Nice to see you all. Last, uh, last call for dessert. Don't be shy. A little coffee, a little brownie, a little cookie. Keep your keep you focused on what we're doing tonight. Good. All right. Well, we're missing all our high school students from uh, last week, so. Um, but that was a nice addition to our our little gathering last week. Uh, before I start, I want to remind you that next week we pause in our study of Mark and go over to the sanctuary to hear Ralph, Ross Douthat, who is um, a columnist for the New York Times, and um, he will be our last in our Faith and Society speaker series. Um, and I think you'll find him uh, compelling. Uh, we, uh, we work hard with this series to provide a, a variety of views from a variety of different perspectives when it comes to the faith and society and the church and what we believe and how we apply what we believe. And um, so uh, uh, Mr. Douthat comes uh, kind of from the conservative side of the Christian family, Roman Catholic, um, but very um, insightful. And um, I think you'll, you will, I'm sure, appreciate what he has to say, or if you don't appreciate what he has to say, you'll, um, you'll write me an email. So um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm used to those. Um, and uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll come to that, and that will um, be stimulating for you, I'm sure. And then the following week, we'll be back here uh, for a couple of weeks, and then we'll take another break for Holy Week. And then uh, we'll be back again uh, for the last uh, few Wednesdays of April. And at the end of April, we will finish up. So my boss tells me, Mengi, Mengi the boss tells me to, um, but uh, we're going to take our time getting through the end of Mark. We are in the 14th chapter and making our way through what uh, Mark would suggest to us just by the volume of material that he has uh, in these last few days of Jesus' life. Um, he sends us the cue that you know, this, is, uh, this is what it's all about, what, what's happening here in these last few days of Jesus' life, what we call the passion of the Christ. So we will um, we'll take our time making our way through that and try to glean from, um, from uh, these stories and from Mark um, some of the deeper truths of who we are and our relationship with God and our yearning to do uh, the will of God, which comes to the fore here in these, um, in these verses and chapters at the end of God, the Gospel of Mark. So, uh, without further ado, let me pray for us. Thank you, O oh God, for this chance to um, reflect on your word. And we pray that you will give us um, the gift of attention that needs to be paid to the unfolding events of Mark's gospel and Jesus' life. And pray that we may uh, glean from these words the deeper truths of uh, your will and purpose and um, the mission that you would have for our lives. So we pray that we will um, sense that reality in these, in these minutes to come. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. So I want to begin by reading um, a little poem that was written, let's see, 40, 50, over 50 years ago by a, a seminary uh, student by the name of Kent Keith. And I've quoted this before in, um, in a, a couple of sermons. It's a poem often attributed to Mother Teresa, um, but it wasn't written by Mother Teresa, it was written by this young 23-year-old, 24-year-old seminarian. 
Mother Teresa loved it so much that she had it hanging uh, in her uh, quarters in India. <clears throat> and when I start, you'll recognize this, I'm sure, but it's very apropos to what we're going to be uh, focusing on over these next few um, these next few weeks as we make our way in our effort to follow Jesus to the cross. And they're called the paradoxical commandments. The paradoxical commandments. Write that down. Because afterwards you're going to say, what was that called? The paradoxical? I got to talk to Pastor Steve on the way out and find out how I get to this. If you Google paradoxical commandments, you will find this and you can print it and have it for yourself, or you may not even want to. So, Paradoxical, paradoxical Commandments by Dr. Kent M. Keith. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. If you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. The biggest men and women with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men and women with the smallest minds. Think big anyway. People favor underdogs, but follow only top dogs. Fight for a few underdogs anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you do help them. Help people anyway. Give the world the best you have, and you will get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. I read that to you tonight because I think it's a wonderful introduction for the attempt we will make to kind of focus on what is happening with uh, this journey of Jesus to the cross as he um, has now already arrived in Jerusalem and the days have gone by. He has uh, come to the day of Passover where he is uh, celebrating with his, with his uh, disciples uh, and all of the, the path that Jesus is pursuing is a path that is getting him closer and closer into the, into the jaws of the lion, right? And, and along the way, all of Jesus' effort to do what he has been called to do, what he understands his mission to be, what the Father has given him to do, all of this is going to be met with, um, with an adverse response. And yet Jesus continues to go forward. This is an important thing to pay attention to. Jesus continues to go forward. Um, at one point he pauses and wonders if he can or is there another option? Is there another plan? We'll talk about that. But all through this journey, Jesus is going forward. And all this is set up by a story that we looked at last week at the beginning of uh, Mark 14. You may remember the scene of Jesus with Simon the leper. He is the, he is the guest of the host of this feast. Simon the leper calls him to his home. Jesus is guest. And who should show up? but this unwelcome guest, this person who really shouldn't be there, she's got all kinds of strikes against her, um, but she shows up, she, um, she, she um, invades the party. 
And, uh, and she does this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful act uh, to, um, to recognize what was happening, that there was, there was this rabbi and there is somebody here that people need to pay attention to. She, of all people, is the only one who can see who Jesus is. She's the only one. The disciples can't quite see who Jesus is. Simon the leper can't quite see who Jesus is. Certainly the members of the Sanhedrin that we're going to be meeting here as these events unfold, they can't see Jesus for who he is. But this woman, she can see Jesus for who she is. And her response is, um, is commensurate with what she sees. She sees who Jesus is, and she takes this big jar of nard, this, this perfume, this ointment, and she breaks it open and dumps the whole thing over on Jesus, which is excessive, but it is commensurate with what she sees. She sees Jesus as being somehow associated with God. She doesn't articulate what she thinks he is, but she is responding to what what he is, or perhaps what he has done for her. And all the rest of the people in the room stand up and applaud her. No. Huh. This most beautiful thing, this most costly thing, this most extraordinary thing, um, this thing that Jesus says will be remembered until the end of time is met with scorn, criticism, um, you know, theological argument as to what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And, uh, and that is a, an omen for what is going to continue to unfold in this story. That What's he say? People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Do good anyway. This is, I think, one of the hardest lessons of life, right? Because we're human beings, and, and human beings recoil from... Um, from mistreatment, or they recoil from false accusations. They recoil from um, criticism, and uh, and yet what we're what we're watching here is are those who are making themselves vulnerable to all of that in the effort to continue to move forward and to do the very thing that they believe God has called them to do. So uh, th that sort of serves as the backdrop, and it will, uh, I think, hopefully help us to um, gain appreciation not only for what Jesus does. Watch this. I will misplace this, and your job is to point it out when I... Um, hopefully this will help us to gain some perspective on how Mark tells the story of Jesus heading to the cross and, um, and what it is to mean for us when we try to understand uh, this movement of Christ. So last week we, we looked just very briefly at the story of the Last Supper. Um, we looked at the preparation leading up to the Last Supper. I read real quickly through the story and, um, and acknowledged uh, this Eucharistic formula, remember, that you know, Jesus took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread, and how that formula gets repeated all the way through the Gospels. You know, Jesus takes the bread, blesses the bread, breaks the bread, gives the bread when he feeds the 5,000. Jesus takes the bread, blesses the bread, um, and breaks the bread and gives the bread when he is serving those in Emmaus. Their eyes are open when they see that formula unfold right in front of, the, right in front of their very eyes. 
And so, um, and so here we have in, in communion, in the, what we call communion, what they call the Last Supper, what they call the Passover feast, Jesus does the very same thing. And so we're, we're listening for that, and, um, and we're realizing that there's something to be said about um, even what we do today, right? So today, this is past Sunday, what did we do? Um, you know, Jim Biev here, I think it was Sarah, Jim Biev there, Sarah here, um, took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it uh, to acknowledge the presence of Jesus. But a couple other things to pay attention to in this uh, story of the Last Supper, beginning at verse 17. If you brought your Bibles, you can read along, or uh, you can throw open your phone, and you can read through that if you'd like. Mark 14, verses 17 and following. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes, as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. There's a couple of things that I, I think are important for us to pay attention to. We who are uh, of the post Markan community. So one of the things, again, you may recall that when we're reading this, we are keeping in mind that uh, a couple of things. We're not only keeping in mind our own lives and our own present day circumstances, but we're also keeping in mind that original Markan community, right? This community that's just kind of wondering where are we going because the world's falling apart and the temple's collapsing and who are we um, and, and what do we do in response to that? They're, they're trying to get clues from this. Okay, how do we live? How do we, how do we make our way forward? And so there's a, there's, a, um, there's a reality that gets revealed in this story and it's interesting how where the set, what the setting is, where this reality gets revealed. And the reality is this is, there is no such thing as a perfect community. These guys have been with Jesus for, 12, for three years. They've been traveling with him. They've been doing ministry with him. And they gather together, and it's the Passover feast. They are at the, they're in Jerusalem for the first time, according to Mark. And John, Jesus is going back and forth in and out of Jerusalem all the time. But in Mark's gospel, this is his first visit, and this is at the pinnacle where he's made pilgrimage with his disciples, and they're gonna celebrate the Passover meal. They are, you know, this is the, this is the Super Bowl. I'm not sure if Jesus would appreciate that analogy, but this is, this is the big deal, right? And there is one in their midst who has other ideas. There is one in their midst who is already enacting, putting together a plan to betray him. And Jesus knows that. Jesus doesn't ask him to leave. Jesus knows that in our midst, somebody who is dipping their bread with the rest of us is setting out to betray me. And that's an interesting model for us to keep in mind when we think about being the church, right? Because we are the new creation. We are the new community, right? That's what the church is. The church is always seeking to be the new community. That's what the Holy Spirit was all about, bringing us together and to be the new community. And guess what? If you're looking for a perfect community, not happening. And I, I, you know, I talk to so many people that say, well, I, I left that church because it wasn't perfect, and I went over to this church, and I left, you know, I left that church because it wasn't perfect, and I that church it wasn't perfect. Or that person looked cross-eyed at me, and doggone it, I'm never going back. Um, and, and sometimes we get deceived into thinking that somehow Jesus has left behind this perfect community. Well, he couldn't affect perfect community when he had control over it. When he was gathered with his own disciples, there was this plan afoot. And Jesus acknowledges that. And, and part of, I think, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, 
is he's talking about how do we be a community together? Because it isn't going to be perfect friends. And guess what? There's a lot of differences, and we don't always agree. And sometimes we don't act in everybody's interest. And sometimes uh, somebody says something we don't, you know, we think is heresy. Whatever the case may be, how do we do this? And that's right smack dab in the middle of that. Paul writes the love chapter and says, "Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends." So, and, and the church, the community, becomes the laboratory of love. You bear with one another's burdens, and you, um, and you endure and, um, and one another as you seek to love one another. So that's what's happening in, um, in the sacrament, uh, in, in the uh, Last Supper, in the, the Passover, is Jesus is acknowledging that this is the reality that we live in as I continue my way to the cross. Jesus doesn't say, and therefore, Judas, I stop loving you. Jesus doesn't say to Peter, well, she see this in a minute, when he says, Peter, guess what, you're going to deny me three times, and when you do, I stop loving you. Or, you've got no place in the church. doesn't say that. He just says, this is going to happen. Why? Because this is the reality of what it means to be a human being. So later in this little pericope, I, oh, there's another word. Do you all know the word pericope? Oh, let me write that one down. Um, I'm giving you so much, I mean, you got to be really impressing your friends with all this. Pericope, P-E-R-I-C-O-P-E. -E. It looks, it's almost like periscope. P-E-R-I-S-C-O-P-E -E would be periscope, but this is pericope, and pericope are those little paragraphs that you see in your Bible. It's the translator's effort to somehow cluster the stories or the sayings or the teachings of Jesus, uh, as well as other parts of Paul's letters and whatnot, trying to kind of collect um, the string of thought or the narrative that goes from one scene to the next. So when I say pericope, I'm, I'm referring to the particular cluster of verses I'm looking at in the present moment. So the pericope, I'm not sure exactly how you'd use that in a cocktail party next time you <laughs> are your friends. Tell me about the last pericope you read in the Bible. Uh, but in this pericope, it ends with Jesus saying, after he has declared that somebody is going to betray him, he says this, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better that what that one not to have been born. And, um, and I want to illustrate it this way, that as Jesus is, um, is making his way to the cross, he is doing so clearly with an understanding that he is of the will and purpose of God, that, uh, that he has come to the world as John tells us, God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life, and that God sent the son of the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16 and 17 was in our text this past Sunday. So Jesus is on this mission to love the world. And, and he knows that this is the will of God, so he continues to move forward all the way through the, God, uh, the, the gospel of Mark, to enact this love of God. And he does it by teaching, he does it by healing, he does it by you know, revealing himself through miracles, by feeding 5,000 people, by curing blind people, by suffering the, you know, the, the disciples who you know, are kind of clueless half the time. But Jesus continues down this path because he's on this mission to love the world and he has been sent by the Father. Um, and there's a... There's this fundamental truth, back to the paradoxical commandments. If you are going to be on this mission 
of uh, loving the world with the divine love of the Father, um, and you are going to do so in such a way that you are not only sent by God, the Son of God, but that you are also the Son of Man. You are both God and human, right? We believe that's who we have historically come to understand that Jesus is, um, is, is fully God and fully human. So God, Jesus is experiencing relationship with the Father, but he's also experiencing the realities of being human. And we're going to see this come to spades when we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has, he has union with the Father, and he has union with being human. And so therefore, he experiences the glory of the Father, but he also experiences the trials of being human. And one of those consistent trials of being human is if you do good, no good deed goes unpunished, right? No good deed goes unpunished. We say that all the time, kind of cast it off. But, but the truth is the paradoxical commandments are, are truer than you think when it comes to how Jesus is making his way. And what Mark is wanting to show us as Jesus makes his way to the cross, is that while Jesus is pursuing this will, which is to continue to be who he is, continue to be the vessel of God's love for the world, there is going to be the inevitable pushback of human beings. So when Jesus, so when Jesus says this, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, meaning as the Son of Man continues down this path of loving the world, sacrificially giving himself for the world, woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Because inevitably, and this is you know, pretty profound theology here, inevitably, if you pursue the will of God, you are going to pay for it. You don't get off if you pursue the will of God. You don't, God doesn't like put a shield of protection around you and say, oh, well, as long as you do my will, everything's going to be fine. No, quite to the contrary. To pursue the will of God, as it is written, Jesus says, guess what? There's going to be somebody who shows up and says, I will, I will double-cross you. I will, I will um, betray you, and later I will deny you. Oh, and later, I will desert you. But that comes with the territory. So there are two things happening in parallel. Jesus seeking to pursue the will of God and the, um, and the efforts on the part of many, including the Sanhedrin, to, uh, to get in the way of that pursuit. And that is as natural as... That is as natural as it is for us to be human. My, uh, my, my granddaddy used to say that the definition of original sin is to put two two-year-olds in a room with one toy. And, and that's a, it's an interesting illustration because those two two-year-olds, they are we call them free agents, right? We say human beings are free. They're free to, you know, that we, 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 we celebrate the freedom that God gives us. You know, we have freedom to make choices. Those two two-year-olds, are they're free. You put one toy in, shut the door. It doesn't take but 30 seconds before they're screaming and yelling and one toy getting slammed on top of the other toy, the other kid's head. And you say, and, and, and we, because we are wise Adults said, well, we knew that was going to happen. Well, yeah, but it didn't have to happen, right? But that's the reality of our human condition, right? As, as much as God would give us God's blessing, oh, we have a way of turning that around and going to war about it, right? God sends his only son into the world, and we strap him to the cross. 
That's a part of what it means to be a human being. And so one of the sobering things, and this is why it's so good that we're studying this in the midst of Lent, one of the sobering things about our <clears throat> about the study is that it invites us into ourselves. And as we're studying these disciples and as we're studying the, re, the response and the, um, um, you know, and the pushback that they're offering to what Jesus is doing, it's an invitation not to say, well, you know, you know if, I'd, if that had been me, I wouldn't have done that. No, Mark's saying, oh, no, 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 no. You're sitting at table with Jesus, and you're one of the betrayers. You're one of the deniers. You're one of the deserters. Get real. And, and we're being set up for an ending that is, you know, is pretty significant. But we have to make our way to the cross and experience what the disciples are experiencing. So as the, you know, the Son of Man goes, as it's written, this is the way it's going to be. God's going to love the world. Oh, and by the way, too bad for Judas because he gets to be the representative of the human condition. Um, you know, there's lots of people that postulate over, you know, whether Judas was in, ended up in hell or whether he ended up in heaven and blah, 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 blah. The reality is I think the invitation for us is to say, well, you know, before you start thinking about all those things, just understand you are in Judas' shoes. So when you're talking about it, you're talking about yourself. And, um, and then, then, you know, things become real when we try to understand what is it that we are called to be and to do uh, in relationship to um, this unfolding story. So, half hour for... Five verses, excellent. <laughs> While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take this as my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. For truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Um, Mark is very, spar is very spare when it comes to his description of the sacrament. He doesn't put in a, any theological language, doesn't try to explain it all, doesn't, you know. I mean, we have spent 2,000 years trying to unpack exactly what all that meant. What did Jesus mean when he said, this is my body broken for you? What does Jesus mean when this is, you know, the cup of, my cup of the, co my blood of the covenant poured out, not just for you, but for many, well, we've been trying to unpack that for 2,000 years. But there is, this, um, there is this meal, this meal of Passover. Jesus is you know, enacting this uh, important Jewish feast, this important Jewish celebration. And, uh, and, but he um, puts himself into it and allows these to be symbols of something that is unfolding. And, and what's unfolding is that the Son of God is, is coming into the realities of human existence, and the reality is, is that the body will be broken as a result of this, the cup will be poured. Um, we, in hindsight, can see the finger of God making its, his way through this, but in in real time, all they can kind of interpret is this rabbi is, is saying something about these elements that for them probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They haven't gotten to the cross yet. In fact, what happens in response to that in verse 26, when they had sung the hymn, Anybody have an idea what that hymn might have been? Amazing Grace? Uh, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Oh God, our help in ages past. It's part of the Seder. Yes, it's part of the Seder. And there were, uh, there were six Psalms in the middle of the book of Psalms, Psalm 113 through 118, which were um, uh, to be sung during the Passover feast. Um, 113, I think, through 
15 are sung at the beginning and then at the end are sung uh, 116 through 118. Don't hold me to those numbers, but uh, many believe that this hymn was at least you know, one of these latter psalms and what's called the Hallel Psalm, 113 to 118. And so Jesus uh, and the disciples sing a hymn, they recite the psalm, whatever it might be, and they uh, make their way from, uh, from, Jeru from the heart of Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. Now, you may remember what I said last week, that Jewish pilgrims were required to celebrate Passover, meaning the 24 hours of Passover inside of Jerusalem. But uh, many scholars believe that you know, they, they had to do a little bit of um, you know, gerrymandering when it came to the Jerusalem because there were so many pilgrims that the Mount of Olives itself became a place where one could continue one's celebration of the Passover. All uh, you know, good, good Jews in this Markan community are overhearing this, and, they're, and if they you know, remember their stories from 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, they remember that King David, uh, who was betrayed by his own son, Absalom, and one of his friends, who was betrayed by these two in Absalom's effort to usurp the king. We read in 2 Samuel where David retires from the heart of Jerusalem and makes his way up to the Mount of Olives. And there he weeps. So those good Jews are listening to this story and they're saying, this is the son of David who has made his journey from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives where he weeps for what is happening to him um, by those that to, with whom he is the closest, uh, his own disciples. Um, and so they go out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters, for it is written, Mark continues to sort of use this formula, it is written because this is a plan of God, God's unfolding plan. Um, and, and I think what's important for us to, pay attention to when we talk about God's plan is that God's plan is revealed when we are pursuing God's mission. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of corny theology out, out there that wants to say that everything that happens to me is God's plan. Hmm. I'm not sure that's a New Testament understanding, especially if we focus on the mission and purpose of Jesus. What happens to Jesus is the result of his effort to love the world. He is paying the consequences of the agape love, the sacrificial love. And so when we, um, when we see Jesus making his way and these things happening to him, we, we got to keep focused on the fact that um, what we're being called to, remember we've been talking about the way, Jesus is revealing to us the way, the truth, and the life. When we're called to the way, we must understand that the consequences of God's plan is adversity. You, you really can't get around it. Um, because God's ways are not our ways, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And so these are the kinds of consequences that are bound to happen. So Jesus says, um, for it is written, I, well, he says, uh, Jesus said to them, you all will become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's from Zechariah chapter 13. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, oh, even though all become deserters, I will not. Good old Peter. <clears throat> I'm Peter. I'm Peter. Are you Peter? Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. So, again, the consequences. John's Gospel tells us of a, a more proactive God when it comes to 
how all these events are orchestrated. For example, John will say, when, um, when the devil put it into Ju when, when the devil put it into Judas heart, um, it's almost as if God is kind of backing away and letting the devil kind of do his thing. Um, in, in Mark's account, it's this sort of proactive Jesus who is experiencing the consequences uh, of his love, including this uh, fickle friend that he has named Peter who claims that he will uh, be with him all the way to the very end. And Jesus says, no, three times you will deny me. And so uh, in response to that, they go to the place called Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives. And in verse 32, he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John. And we remember these three because they've been taken by Jesus to other places to experience um, the manifestations of Christ. Uh, the one we perhaps most remember is they are taken to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration and see Jesus transfigured before them. And they, um, they, are, and they are invited into that communion of glory. Uh, but guess what? It's not always a communion of glory. Sometimes it's a communion of suffering. And so Jesus, who says, come with me up to the top of the mountain and I'll show you my glory, says to the same three, he says, come into the center of the garden and watch me suffer. And so they follow him into the center of the garden of Gethsemane. And he says to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death, Remain here with me and keep awake. Where did we hear that before? Remember when Jesus is talking about the eschatological, the end of time and the return of, the return of Christ, and he says, keep awake, keep alert, keep awake, keep awake. And so not two chapters later, Jesus pulls his disciples, his top three, uh, together with him into the middle of the garden, says, suffer with me, suffer with me, just stay awake. And, uh, and going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, this is the same Simon who like six verses before had said, I'm your guy. Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we're talking about Jesus pursuing this road of love, this path to the cross, and he's experiencing communion with the Father, and he's experiencing the realities of being human, all the way to the point where he doubts the mission. He doubts the mission. This is what happens to all the saints, right? They, they pursue what they believe to be the pure call of God, and they work their way into the mouth of the lion, into all the pushback, all the adversity, all the criticism, all the, the woundedness that comes with that. And there comes a time where they doubt the dark night of the soul. Jesus is bearing our humanity, and he's experiencing the dark night of the soul where he doesn't know whether he can go on. It's not unlike the prophet Elijah, who does what God calls him to do and, and has that great contest on the top of Mount Horeb, and, and he, um, you know, he defeats the prophets of Baal, and, um, and that, but the, the, the reward for all that is that he becomes a fugitive, and the king of Israel is chasing him down, and he finally just gives up and says, enough. I'm done. 
Now, I know I'm a prophet. I know I'm, go I'm done. And that's a part of this journey. That's a part of this calling that if we take it seriously, we are inevitably, inevitably going to experience. And Jesus, in a sense, says to the Father, Mark calls it Abba. There's been some mistranslation of that word Abba. I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, this is Jesus using a very intimate um, image of Father, like Daddy, like a little child would say Daddy. But uh, from what I could tell, working on this passage over the last week or so, is that Abba is actually more of a, 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 a title of respect. Abba is Father. Abba is our Father who art in heaven. It's I know who you are, and I, and I respect you, and I want to do your will, but I'm asking that you take this cup from me. I can't do it. Um, if you've ever had that experience in life where you can't do it, where you feel like you just can't go any further, well, know that Jesus has had that experience too that he, he can't go on any further. And what's, what's Mark setting up for us here is um, this is a very unique king. This is a very unique savior. This is not um, a Marvel comic character. This is not some Superman hero. This is the one who is doing what he, what he he knows he should do. He's pursuing the hard path, and he gets finally overwhelmed at what faces him, and he, um, in, he encounters it like you and I would encounter it, because he is embracing our humanity while he seeks to be about the mission of, Christ, the mission of God, which is to love the world. And, you know, that... That should give us great hope, I think, because uh, when we read this story of Jesus, um, we're basically invited into this journey that we know that Jesus has taken already, so that when we suffer, we know that our Lord has suffered with us. When we, are, when we, get, when we face adversity, we know our Lord faced adversity. When we want to give up, all well, we know that our Lord wanted to give up too. When we pray, let this cup pass from me, we know that Jesus prayed the same prayer. And so with that comes hope because it, we, we can never, we, we can hopefully sense that we are never alone as we are seeking to pursue this mission of love. Um, and so Jesus is not only let down by his disciples, but uh, continuing on, uh, he says, uh, Mark says, and again he went away, saying the same words, and once more he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough, the hour has come, the Son of Man is betrayed into, <clears throat> the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going, see my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus has this moment of doubt, this dark night of the soul, and yet at the end of the day, he gets up and he continues on. I didn't like much of The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Have you seen that movie? A few of you have? Um, it's, a, it's just one of those intense movies. I like parts of it, the one the part I liked most was right at the beginning um, where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he's praying, he's praying in Aramaic, um, as he's praying, this white snake slithers into the garden. And it comes coming closer and closer to Jesus. And it's like making its way up like it's going to just lay its jaws into Jesus' neck. 
and, uh, and Jesus is just praying fervently. It's, it's, it's a really amazing portrayal of this wrestling that Jesus is doing in the garden and this just, you know, this agony that he experiences. And, uh, and you're wondering, you know, here comes that snake. You know, it's the symbol of the devil, of course, and what's going to happen? And at, finally, at one point, Jesus gets up and he just stomps on the snake and makes his way out of the garden. And I, I, I never, uh, that image has never left my mind when I think about what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's, he's in this time of great doubt, dark night of the soul. Where do I go? How can I get out of this? You know, is there an exit plan here? And then at some point, Jesus gathers up his resolve, stomps on the snake and says, let us proceed. And where does he proceed? He proceeds right into the hands of the Sanhedrin guard who are there to arrest him, uh, led by Judas of all, uh, of all people. Um, <clears throat> and let me just stop there because I'll go too fast with the rest of the stuff. So um, thoughts, questions about? And this is heavy stuff. I understand, kind of intense. So we got Doris, and then we got Greg over here after Doris. Um, really, just a comment. I guess in, in reading chapter 14 today, it just struck me that how much we or I conflate all the story, the four Gospels, in recalling the Passion. I know we do that at Christmas time, and we have the, you know, we have the shepherds and the magi at, right, all right. at the same time. But I didn't realize um, until I was reading it and thought, what happened to the washing of the feet? What happened to Palm Sunday? And then realized they're not even in this gospel. Mm -hmm. So it, I guess when I am listening to the passion, you know, in, in church services, I must put those stories in because I know the stories and sure. I just assume they're in there and there's just one there's just one passion story. Right, right. No, it's a great point. Thank you for raising it. Yeah, it, you know, what's, what's really, um, I mean, it's hard to avoid that, right? I mean, because we, we put all the stuff together and we make this little narrative out of it that's got different elements in it. And I don't blame people for doing that, especially at Christmas time. Like you say, we got, you know, wise men and shepherds all in the same manger, you know. Um, doesn't happen that way, at least not according to the gospel writers, but that's fine. We put the whole story together. Probably got informed by a Radio City Music Hall at the Christmas show, right? Because, you know, they you got the whole story unfolding before you and the Rockettes dancing, you know. Um, I don't think the Rockettes were in there. Um, anyway. Um, but what we lose with that is that each gospel writer is trying to tell, is, is, Pulling a thread through the story that we that he he doesn't want us to miss. Every gospel writer says, this is an important thread. And don't, don't lose this thread because it says something important. And it says something very important to the community to which it's being written. So we're listening for that thread in Mark's gospel trying to not be distracted by all the other stories, because all the other stories are trying to address different threads, right? And so um, in Mark's gospel, we're looking at this, and we're seeing this thread that Mark keeps telling, as is written, as is written, Jesus is on this mission. Jesus is here to, you know, to, um, to love the world, as is written, as is written. Oh, and by the way, what the consequence of all that is, you have these people who are pushing back who don't want Jesus to be about this mission, and they and the, the consequences of divine love is human is human sin. The very sin that Jesus is trying to free us from is the sin that undoes him. And therein lies that paradox, right? The paradox of the commandments, the paradox of human existence. No good deed goes unpunished. So great. As you're talking through the story tonight, it sounds like really they were all betrayers, not just Judas. 
that they denied him, they, they fled, they ran away, nobody stood behind him. Is that overreaching? <laughs> no, no, it's in fact, um, and we'll probably, we will look at it next week, um, in verse uh, 50 of Mark 14, uh, after Jesus is arrested, uh, he says, day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. There again, let the scriptures be fulfilled. This, 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 is, this has been the plan all along. Not that Jesus is, not that God is trying to make Judas betray Jesus, not that God is trying to make Peter deny Jesus. God's not making them do anything. It's just the, the reality of our human condition. That's just who we are. Uh, and then it says in verse 50, all of them deserted him and fled. So to your point, they're all complicit in this uh, abandonment of, of Christ. All of them. All of us. We all have our own way of trying to get our own angle on this thing. Um, and all of it has to do with how do we avoid, which explains, you know, if you're in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus says, blessed are those of you who are persecuted and reviled for my sake. He's just describing the human condition. He's not saying, oh, I think it's a really good thing that what he's blessing is our, our commitment to continue the path, right? Um, you know, I've used the analogy before of, you know, we've been talking recently about the civil rights movement. And some of you went to the concert here on, on um, Sunday night about the Children's March in Birmingham. I mean, uh, just awful, you know, um, consequences for pursuing justice, right? Um, doing the right thing. And what, when you do the right thing, the world's going to turn on you because the world doesn't want the right thing. So, um, so yeah, and so our human condition is that we, tr we turn and run and try to avoid whatever those consequences might be. Another minute or two, if you have any other questions. Ah, didn't drink enough coffee or starting to fall asleep. I see. I see. Okay. So we'll pick up uh, next time, two weeks from today, uh, at verse 43, as uh, we see Jesus being um, arrested and making his way uh, to be tried by the religious leaders. So let us pray. Thanks, O oh God, for this um, great story and we seek to be ourselves in the story we want to know what it it was like when your son prayed in agony we want to know what it was like um, to be those disciples who fled in one sense we already know what it's like because we've experienced that but we pray that you will help us to learn about this way that Christ is walking that would allow us to love the world despite the consequences um, such that your will will be revealed through who we are and what we do. So bless us into the evening and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.